I just want to do a little recapping from from last week. Uh, we heard two dynamic, intense messages on the new covenant. And uh, we heard a lot about how much Jesus loves us. And I just want to put that down. It's as much as I believe that, it's it's still Robin, it's still hard for me to wrap my mind around how God loves the unlovely. But he does. How he loves the folks that I cannot like bravely. <laughs> <laughs> but Jamie in your heart did a wonderful job in sharing the love of God and how it's unconditional. Amen. But today I want to I want to kind of recap that, but first I want to go back to the Old Testament for something. Uh, Jamie talked a lot about the law, and the Bible tells us that the law gives sin its muscle. It gives strength to sin. And while we don't want to do that, uh, I grew up in the church with a mixed message. We taught Jesus loves us, but he also sent you to hell in a handbasket. So, you know, it don't take a, a, a rocket scientist to figure out that uh, that's an oxymoron. You know, either he loves you or he don't. You know? So... <clears throat> I just did a lot of studying in the Old Testament this week. And uh, I began to see some things that um, I hadn't really saw before. The children of Israel had, you know, Joseph had brought his family to Egypt. And that was like a Canaan land for them because they were starving. Most, uh, Joseph gets to, he gets to, be in the palace and he's in rulership and he brings his family down there to Egypt and they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow and grow and, grow and, and uh, so <clears throat> things have changed drastically from the time they leave Egypt from that time until from the time they got to Egypt that's about 430 years now they were favored when they got there right Amen. But now, at the time of their leaving Egypt, they were slaves. Now, you can, let's, this 2017, let's go back in our mind, if we could, 430 years back. Do you think things have changed here in America from 430 years back? <laughs> yes. A lot. What would that be? Year of what? Some of you mathematicians. That would put us back to about what? 1600 and something? <laughs> Okay, in 1500, Martin Luther came out of the Catholic Church in the early 1500s. So, uh, Wesley Brothers hadn't started the Methodist Church until 1700. So, in between that, the church has, has embraced a lot of revelation between that time and this. Is that correct? Yes. Did you say that? Amen. We've come a long ways. I still say we're coming out of the Dark Ages, though. <coughs> Yes. Maybe we've come a long ways, but there's still, I said this way, I still think there's more, uh, more that I don't know in the Bible than what I know. But I've learned a lot, and I've come a long ways, and I've come a, a long way from all those rules and regulations to being free in the Spirit. As Lynn Howe says, we're free, but, you know, Paul said, uh, Everything's lawful, but not everything's expedient. I think uh, Lynn Hiles has the best analogy on that. He said, there's not a law against you kissing a rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> it's not expedient, though. <laughs> there's not a law against that. There's not a law in the books anywhere that says you can't do that. But it's not expedient. It's not really good. So the children of Israel had come from being favored down in Egypt to now they're slaves. And uh, in, each, in Exodus chapter 1, I'm just going to read a, a few verses there. Uh, we don't have anybody on the computer today. Anybody could do that? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you couldn't do any worse than me because I want to apologize, Mike. I was listening to you and I forgot. And okay. so there's a few seconds this right. wasn't on you. <laughs> in Exodus chapter 1, the Bible says, And the children of Israel were, in verse 7, were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And he said to these people, Behold, the people of Israel are more mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and come to pass that when there falleth out any war, that they join with our enemies, fight against us, so that so get so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasured cities. Verse twelve, and but the more they afflicted them, the more they what? Multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve them with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bodies and mortar and brick and all the manner of service in the field. All their services wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew made midwives and told them that basically when a baby is born, Kill the, kill the males, two years and nine. Well, the Bible goes on to say that the midwives feared God. They tell the pharaohs, and you know what? These, these, these Hebrew women, they're pretty lively. When they get down there to deliver that baby, they're already born. They're not like the Egyptian women. So uh, after that law didn't work, he, he made a new law and said, all right, I want you to cast all the babies two years and under in the river. Okay? That's kind of the story of Pharaoh and the, and the Egyptians versus the Israelites. Now, there's something that, that I grew up with thinking the Israelites were all down there having prayer meetings. They loved God, they worshiped the Lord, but I began to see that wasn't the case. You know, after 400 years, let's say the, let's say the first 50 years they worshiped the Lord. They remembered the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Maybe by a hundred years had gone by, maybe some of that had slipped. Now they're around all the people that worship idols. They're around all the people that are just pagans. And, you know, little by little it starts slipping away. Hebrew, the book of Hebrews even says, let's give more earnest heed to the things that we've, that we've studied and read and learned, lest at any time we let them slip. So by the time God sends Moses down there to deliver the children of Israel, Moses was, you know, was, was they found him in the river, and the, the Pharaoh's daughter raised him, and all that kind of stuff, and he grew up in the palace, and really Pharaoh was grooming him to be the next Pharaoh. But that wasn't God's plan, okay, without getting into a lot of detail about that. God raised up Moses to deliver the children of Israel, and he said, go down there and tell them I'm going to set them free. But I, I read this in the scriptures this week. He said, but, the, but Pharaoh ain't going to let you go. <laughs> Told him out right up front. I've sent him Moses to deliver you, but he's not going to let you go. So they, he said, I've got to prove to the Israelites that I'm Lord. Well, in Exodus chapter 2, it says in verse 24, and God heard their groanings. It didn't say God heard their prayer meetings. Now they were groaning because they were burned by all of this work seven days a week. Now the Egyptians went out and gathered straw and brought it to them. And they made the bricks and out of other stuff, mortar and straw and, and so forth. But when Moses told them he was going to deliver them and he started talking to Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, now you've got to make more bricks, but you're going to have to go get the straw. We're not going to get it for you. So he made it much harder for them. Now, uh, they have become pagans in their worship. And the Lord says he remembered his covenant with Abraham. They didn't come out of Egypt because they prayed themselves out. 
they came out because God remembered his, his covenant with their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He remembered that. He did hear their groanings and their moanings, I suppose, but he remembered his covenant with Abraham, so that's why he brought them out. Not because they're down there having prayer meetings. That just, I began to see some things in this that I hadn't really seen before. So, anyway, let's, let's skip all the plagues. You know about all the plagues that came. <clears throat> Uh, as they left Egypt, they came to the Red Sea. The Red, <laughs> I'm just amused at stuff I had read over in the Bible. The Lord Moses cried out. To, he said, "Why are you crying out to me? <laughs> said, Do something about it. Speak to him. Tell him to go forth. You got a rod. Raise it up. Sea parted. They come. They started through the Red Sea and so forth and." Anyway, you know the story how the sea covered up Pharaoh's army and all of that. But anyway, that's because Moses spoke to it. Anyway, as they left Egypt, they moaned and they groaned and they complained. You brought us out here to die. We should have just left us in Egypt. They're not very thankful. They're still a pagan group. Hebrews. But they've left their God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a long, long, long time ago. You can, it takes a lot of chapters to read. I've read them so many times this week. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> they moan and groan, and so finally, the Lord says, okay, I'll provide, you know, Lynn Howe used to say he provided Krispy Kreme donuts. But I did say, it says the little round things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so might, might be like the lens. I don't know. We made that up. But it is say the round things showed up on the ground. It was bread. They still moaned and groaned, so God provided quail. And they got the quail every day, and they got the, the, the one by morning and one by night. They still moaned and groaned. What about water? Now the water is bitter. All right, so God told Moses to put a tree in the water. Changed it, made it. Sweet. They just kept moaning and groaning. Three months into this journey, God says, hold it. Now, can you imagine three to five million people camping together? <laughs> Jackie's the closest hugging you over here. <laughs> I mean, they're like this. You know, they're close. Now, according to what the Bible's going to tell us, they must have been kids of fighting, couldn't get along. They brought along their, their, their religious uh, ideas about graven images and all this stuff. Kids of fighting, couldn't, wouldn't have paid the parents, and stealing from one another. And, you know, I just got thinking about this. You know, we take a shower today. Me and Linda have been married 48 years, but I still shut the door. Now, three to five million people, just think, they're probably not much privacy. So there's probably a lot of dog rating going on. Right? No, Miss Chance say amen. <laughs> Probably a lot of guys uh, coveting his neighbor's wife. And maybe some, some of them was a little uh, covetous of what another family had. Maybe some of the younger fellas coveted uh, other family's maidservants and their manservants. They probably was stealing from one another. There might have even been some killing going on. Because three months into this journey, the Lord said, hold it. Moses, come up on the mountain. Let me talk to you. And he comes up on the mountain, and the Lord says, thou shalt not have any other gods before thee. Amen. Uh, thou shalt not make any graven images anymore. 
Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. They give them, get us back to Egypt. What did you bring us out here to die for? And remember, keep the Sabbath day holy. You've been working seven days a week. You know, to stop this stuff, you gotta, you know, they brought their cattle along with them and all this journey. I can't imagine the steam. <laughs> a lot of food. <laughs> really? Think about all the oxen, the, the camels, the billy goats, the sheep, all everything they had. Probably a pretty stinky trick. But he said you need to not, not work on the Sabbath day. Rest. <coughs> and you kids, you need to honor your father and mother because that your days might be long on the earth. And don't be committing adultery. And don't be stealing. Thou should not steal. Don't be lying on one another. Don't be bearing false witness. Thou shalt not cover. And goes into detail about what all you shouldn't cover. You covet about everything. And the last one, thou shalt not kill. So evidently that's going on. Now. When we talk about the law from the pulpit, we're really not talking about the Ten Commandments. I see no problem with these. I don't think it's bad to have your kids obey their parents. Is that pretty neat? I'm real. I'm real. I just throw my shoulders back when Daryl writes me notes or says something on Facebook about me. I, that's my wife. <laughs> When they say something about his coaching, now Tim, that's my man. <laughs> I'm proud of Punch. I'm proud of my girls. I'm proud of them. So all these things listen here, I really don't see a problem with. Um, it's not, you know, I don't see anybody carving out engraving images, but we could change that to big posters on the wall. How many kids go to church have a poster <coughs> of a race car driver or athlete or a musician? Or, you know, how many of our kids that go to church know even the names of 12 disciples? Or the books of the Bible? Versus race car drivers or athletes or, you know, singing groups or whatever. We might have some graven images that's not carved out of stone, but they might be carved out on paper. You say something Facebook, just saying. <laughs> wow. Just saying. Amen. Anyway, I, I want to recap some of the things that Jamie talked about this weekend. When we look back and we call it the law, we're really not talking about that as much as when we get to the New Testament, Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees of his day who were the interpreters of this along with other stuff. But they added to it so many rules. I, I was reading in the, the, the Bible dictionary this week. They have added to it so many rules and regulations that weren't even a part of the Mosaic Law that they put the children of Israel, even after they got back to communicating with God, they made them so stringent that they had no, we would say in our day, no wiggle work, no wiggle room. You know, I'll just say it this way. There may be things that I can't do that Bob can do. If we follow the Holy Spirit, there's things that that uh, if I would do it repeatedly, it would lead me in a wrong direction. It may not the first day or second day, but if I repeated that, it may lead me in the wrong direction. And Bob could do the same thing. He just stay true to God. That's why we don't give a statement of faith here. We believe in being following the Holy Spirit. Mike Watson has to follow the Holy Spirit for himself. Merle has to follow the Holy Spirit for herself, and he will always lead us right. He'll never lead us wrong. Amen. There are wrong things. Amen. There are things that are wrong. There are things that are detrimental to our 
not only to our spiritual growth in God, they're just things that are detrimental to our marriage. There's things that are detrimental to our finances. And I used to think you made it spend it. Yeah. I used to throw things out the window so it just creates jobs for somebody to pick it up. I don't do that anymore, you know? Now, Chase, he's over the top of this stuff. With this, uh, Recycling, but I'm not quite as much as he is, but I mean, at least I don't throw it out and say, I just created a job or something. <laughs> you know? But the Pharisees and the Sadducees and other groups, I think about how they didn't get along with each other. The Herodians were different and the, and the lawyers were different. Everybody, and the lawyers of that day are not like the Chase and Michelle lawyers. They were lawyers of the scriptures, of the law. They were law. Their lawyers are something else of our lawyers today. But anyway, when Jesus, when Jesus come on the scene in this, and he's establishing the kingdom of God, he's dealing with Pharisees who had now we're not got ten commandments, we've got a thousand and some commandments. Now that's what we're talking about from the pulpit when we talk about the law. We're not talking about these ten so much, but the spirit of that same thing that the Pharisees did of adding so many laws. You know, in my church, I'm just talking about my church that I grew up in. We had laws. You get saved. We had another altar call for those who want to be sanctified, and I have no flaw with that. And we had an altar call for those who wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I have no problem with that. But they added, women, you can't cut your hair. My mom cut her hair about that much. They called her up in front of the church and really scolded her, took her class away from her. And, and as a little kid sitting on the seat, I, I heard from my mom. I wanted to slap him. <laughs> but at the same time, I loved him. You know, I saw miracles under that ministry. I saw mighty things happen. I, in my in my third or fourth grade mind, I couldn't I couldn't get it all together how God would use somebody and see cancers healed and see see mighty things happen and demonstration of the spirit, yet mom cuts her hair that much and they take her class away from her. I just couldn't. Jackie, I couldn't wrap my mind about that. So when we talk about the law, that's what we're talking about. Things like that. It's that same spirit that gets in all kind of churches. We can't just blame the Catholic, the Methodist, the Lutherans. I mean, we can do it too. You know, the Pentecostals, the Charismatics, the, all of them. We have certain amount of rules of do's and don'ts. That's why it's, it's, uh, it gets scary when we say we don't have any. When I say I don't have any rules, just follow the Holy Ghost. He'll always lead you right. He'll always lead you right. He will never, ever fail you. He'll not lead you in anything that even will put you in debt. You know, we used to go borrow money and pray about it. <laughs> we should have prayed about it first. You know, I look back at my life and just see how much, you know, just how much uh, indebtedness we had. And, you know, it's just, and even today, you go to a car dealer, they don't, they, they want to, how much can you pay? I went to a car dealer over here on, on 435, he said, how much are your payments? I said, I ain't talking about payments. I want to know the difference. One, one dealer, I said, I'll tell you what, if you'll get your price down long enough, I'll give you my car. How's that? I'm looking about the difference. He never would, never would commit to any, any difference. After four hours there, I finally left the dealership. You know, I just want to know the difference. I, I had one car, my brother-in-law was a, 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 um, a sales manager for a, a dealership at one time, and I just went to him and I said, this was years and years ago after Lynn and I had first married, I said, what's my car worth? We had a 68 Chevrolet two-door hard attack. We would have kept that baby. <laughs> Fire engine red, black and tear. <clears throat> and uh, he looked at me and he said it's worth $1,425. And uh, 
So I went to another dealership and he said, well, I'm giving you $2,800 for your car. I said, my car ain't worth but $1,400. He kind of kind of cheap. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll just give it to you. He said, what are your price? Low enough. I'm just saying, some things we just, we don't even pray about. I, yep, so guilty. I'm talking about Lynn and I. So many things we didn't even pray about. We just, we could pay the payment, we just did it. We don't do that now. We pray about it. And we, sometimes we probably move too slow, but I'd rather be too slow on those things that's too fast. And uh, we kind of get a, get a, a consensus on what we're going to do. And if we buy any bigger objects, we talk about it first. And, you know, sometimes we don't buy that. Sometimes we'll buy it four months later. And we pay cash. And it's been so much better just following the Holy Spirit. So we're not going to give a set of rules what you got to do, what you can't do, but follow Jesus. You follow Jesus. And I've said to a lot of people in counseling, if you'll just do what Jesus will do in this situation, and you say exactly what Jesus will say, you don't have anything to worry about. Right. It'll always be right. Every time. It'll always be right. So that's our guy. But anyway, Jesus had these Pharisees to deal with. And so here's what I want you to go to Matthew 22. I'll show what Jesus said about all of this. In Matthew chapter 22. Sorry we don't have it for the screen today, but our PowerPoint people are in class. Uh, Matthew 22, for you who's got your Bible, verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And in Mark chapter 12, it almost says the same thing. Mark chapter 12, uh, verse 28, I believe. Um, and, and one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that they had answered them well, asked him, what is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, like namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandments greater than these. And then in John he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. So, when we talk about the law, if you look at Jesus as the new commandment I give you, that you love one another, it covers all these. If you love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, you're not going to be having any other gods before you. You're not going to be craving, carving out any graven images. You're not going to be taking the Lord thy God's name in vain. You're going to do what's right. You know, and now since the death, burial, and resurrection, Sunday is not the Sabbath. <laughs> that law would get you in trouble a lot of places. That will. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday's not necessarily the Sabbath. They're all the Sabbath. We ch and I tell folks who struggle with you worshiping on Sunday, the Bible says he arose on the morrow after the Sabbath, so we base our Sunday worship on the resurrection. That's all. I had a neighbor I live, he said, Oh, he said, you, you won't go to church on Sunday because you worship the sun god. I said, it has nothing to do with it. I don't even know what you talk about, about the sun god. We, we worship because of the resurrection. But the Saturday's okay. I've got lots of friends down around St. James who worship on Saturday. Great folks. Love them. When I pastored Salem, we fellowship with that church. I have no problem with that. If you want to take out Wednesday, that's great. Knock yourself out. You know, take a day and rest. Take a day and rest. That's God's plan. Whatever day. But they're all holy. Monday's holy for us. You know, I can't worship the God on worship God on Sunday and then Monday act like a demon. <laughs> You know, I have to keep every day holy now. 
Amen. Amen. They're all holy before the Lord. So I look at this, a new commandment I give you, love one another. You're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to be stealing. You're not going to be lying. You're not going to be killing. You're not going to be coveting your neighbor's wife, his manservants, his maidservants, his home, his all his animals. I remember when we used to go to, all be going, in, going to church. When we come up, we had a little lane that was about a half a mile long, long and we come to a gravel road. And right across the road, there was a, our banker had that land and he had probably a hundred headed cattle. And Dad would always say, so the cattle was up there across the road. He said, man, I wish I had them and I wish he had three times that many. <laughs> <laughs> so he made sure he didn't cover it, you know. <laughs> I wish I had them and I wish he had three times that many, you know. So, Anyway, so preaching against the law, we're not talking about the Ten Commandments necessarily. We're talking about the spirit of the Pharisee. Amen. That brings, you know, no matter what you do, churches have so many laws against this, that, and other. And I want, I want all of you to look up here. Here's why they do it. They keep you under their thumb. If they can keep you under their thumb, they can control you. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for all those great amen. You know, it's the truth. <laughs> you know, somebody said to me one time, Brother Mike, you preach like that. You're never going to have anybody. I said, you know what? If I don't, I don't. But I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth. I'd rather preach to 100 or 50 or 25 hungry folks who love Jesus as 3,000 who just come to show up. Somebody said, how many you have a 10? I said, depending on what Sunday. If we have, you know, 40, 60, if we have lunch, we maybe have 100. You know? <laughs> 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 it just depends on where you have lunch that day, you know. But it, you know and Jesus did the same thing. Jesus sure. said they come for the loaves and fishes, you know. They really didn't come to hear what he had to say so much as come to eat. And I love to eat, don't get me wrong, you can tell that. <clears throat> but anyway. So when we talk about the law, we're not talking about the Ten Commandments. Not as much as we're talking about the Pharisaical laws that keep adding laws to the Ten Commandments. I have no trouble, I have no problem with the law of Ten Commandments hanging in our courthouse. They ought to be hanging in our schools. Amen. 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 They ought to be hanging in a lot of public places. Amen. I remember when I, I drove truck for Linda's cousin, uh, we had another guy there that, that was a, a salty Christian. <laughs> he was a little too salty. <laughs> the Bible says you're the salt of the earth. You know? And we had some people stealing. We, had, we pulled refrigerated trailers, so we're hauling meat. And uh, people that, all those refrigerated trailers have little, little doors in the back. So if you're hauling produce, you have a door in the front. As you're going down the road from California to here, you can let the air circulate through there and keep that, uh, like strawberries will grow what we call grow whiskers. Yeah. And you can't, they won't buy them if they got whiskers on them. So a lot of drivers will get up there before they get their load delivered and they'll water them down and knock those whiskers off, you know. <laughs> but anyway, people would, would get a little skinny guy and open that back door. It's just about this tall, about that wide, and crawl in there. It handles a box of meat out, box of meat out. And somebody out there put them in their truck or car. So this salty Christian, he said, why don't you, told my boss, why don't you just put a sign out there that says, God loves you. He said, you know, some of those guys might have a mama that's a Christian or a grandpa or grandma that loves the Lord. And that may trigger something. It ain't going to hurt nobody. Just put that out there. When they start to open that door, they look, God loves you. Now, I, that's, that's pretty tasty. But none of that same salty Christian uh, come out one day after the end of the job, and this guy worked there. He drove a truck, too, and he, he drove locally. His old car, it looked awful. He had duct tape around the headlights and <laughs> around the windshield and had one, one taillight wired in and just kind of hanging out. And, and uh, this salty Christian come out and said, Hey, Doug, said if you, you didn't have enough tape and water, that car wouldn't go down the road, would it? And I seen his face. Just the, the 
the uh, expression on his face, he, he would have liked to have melted into the ground. And I thought, Doug, I mean, the guy said that name was Doug, I forget the other guy's name. I thought, Doug, you just muffed all your witness into that guy. He probably hates you the rest of the time you're here. Well, you don't know who Doug is. He's a little 12-year-old boy got a girl pregnant. And he's raising those two kids, and he's raising that baby, and he's seeing the two those two kids are going to school. And I just start telling him things that that family is going through that doesn't mean nothing about. I said, that's probably all he could afford to drive to work. No wonder we need to be nicer yeah. than normal. Because yeah. Yeah. everybody <coughs> is fighting a battle yeah. of some sort. Everybody's fighting a battle. Yeah. We've got to be kind. That's why Jesus said a new commandment I give you. Not to run somebody down, make fun of what they got, but to love them. And what would have happened if Doug would have got him out by himself, put his arm around and said, How could I help you? How could I help you? Wouldn't that have went further with that guy? Tell him his old car was duct tape and wired wasn't going down the road, we didn't have all that on it. You know, we've got to just be. The Bible says, the New Testament says, the whole creation is groaning for the manifestations of the sons of God. The whole world is groaning for something. The world is messed up. I mean, it, it's, it, it's so full of anger and it's so full of hate. If people could just know what the New Testament really means about the unconditional love of God, it would change their whole outlook. But we get so caught up in all kinds of issues. I see them in Facebook. It just it creeps my heart even that the people who who understands grace are poking fun at the conservatives. This lady came on the other day and said, you know, I come to Jesus in a religious system under legalism mm -hmm. and I'm not going to I'm not going to hate them although I'm not there now I understand grace I love the message of grace I understand the unconditional love of God but those people brought me to Christ and I jumped on there and commented that I said that's a godlike attitude I love it you know I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to be involved in that I grew up in that legalism. I heard from my mom when the pastor made her stand in front of the whole church and be littler because she cut her hair that much. I hated that. I grieved in my heart. I got mad at Dad because he didn't say something. Years later, Dad was sitting at the table and Dad said, Son, I just want to please the Lord. And if, that, if it took that to please the Lord, I was willing. For Mom to lose her class, we just want to please the Lord. You know, it goes a long way with the Lord. It goes a long way with the Lord. He said, just want to please the Lord. I'm driving down 435. This is a new story. I'm driving down 435, and this is back, oh, about 87, 88, 89, somewhere along in there. And I saw this uh, uh, Oldsmobile. What was their big Oldsmobile called? 98. Big 98 Oldsmobile. <laughs> And uh, I looked, and the, the, the hubcaps were taken off, and the bumper was painted black. And I looked, and this, I could see their little head coverings over Mennonites. And I said, I just laughed. I was by myself. I laughed. I stood my head back. And I said, Oh, I bet they didn't take that air conditioner out. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, They think that pleases me. And I said, Lord, forgive me. I'm glad I'm not in that situation. I like my air conditioner. I like my shiny bumper. I like my chrome. <laughs> you know. But if they think that, please the Lord, I'm okay with that. You know, we can fight everything, you know, if we want to. We can just fight everything. I just just love folks. Yes, love folks. So when we <coughs> preach grace, we're not preaching greasy, grace and sloppy, goppy and all that. We're teaching this. That when Jesus died on the cross, he gave his life. 
for the whole human race. I want to read something in 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 20, if you have your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I get thinking I'm going to say next, and I get all the word Genesis. <laughs> Jackie may have to go here to help me. Verse 3 and 6. Uh, in verse 19, What know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which is of God, and you're, you are not your own? And the next verse says, For you are bought with a price. What was the price paid for you? Jesus' the, life. The blood of Jesus. Wasn't Amen. It? it said, So therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And in 2 Peter, it gets, it gets more pointed than that. I don't like this one, but it's true. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I have grown up with what I call mixture. Mixture means grace and some law. I grew up with that. And uh, I know grace is the only way to go. But uh, I still... I see people that's so full of hate in the world and doing so much damage, like the guy that shot all them people. Yeah. You know, you want to help God out with him. <laughs> you know, before he, before he killed himself, you want to bless him with a brick. You know, that, that's, that's kind of our feelings. We forget God loved him too. That doesn't mean he's free off the, you know, it's okay to do what he did. What did I say? Second uh, Peter. Thank you. Second Peter two one. I might have some of y'all read some of these for me. Here it says verse verse one. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. The ones that deny the Lord, he said, he bought them too. And it goes on to say, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. I heard a preacher say not too long ago, and I, I, I have to agree with him. He said, God's not judging America. America's judging themselves. Amen. There is a spiritual law that... that Paul talked about, he said, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. That's still intact. Now, Jamie gave us last two Sundays, or two messages, he, he, he spent a lot of time with teaching uh, the love of, the unconditional love of God. One thing, he said, I probably disagree with a little bit, but the Bible contradicts itself. I think people from a different time frame see things differently. You know, one part, one uh, writer in the New Testament said, uh, Jesus commanded her, uh, Jairus' daughter sick. The other writer said she was dead. Now, was she sick or was she dead? Depending on when you got there. <laughs> right? right? If somebody had a wreck out here and we all saw it, we'd sit from different perspectives, right? That's what I see in the Scriptures. Different time frames, different things are said, different ways of looking at it. So, I don't think personally it, 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 it uh, contradicts itself. Now, in other words, Jesus bought the whole human race in his death. Now, Roman, you got by the look of Romans uh, uh, 5, chapter 5, I think verse 10. <clears throat> Romans 10, 5. It says... Moses describeth the righteousness which is out of the law. I don't think that's what I want. You got chapter 5, Romans chapter 5? I'm sorry. Chapter 5, verse 10. Maybe. He's on the right. For if when we were enemies. There we go. For if what? When we were enemies. For if when we were enemies. We were reconciled to Wait a minute. When was we reconciled? When we were enemies. When we were enemies. 
That was before I come to Jesus at, at age seven and say, forgive me. You know, probably the worst thing I did was lie to my parents. I hadn't killed my mother-in-law yet because I wasn't born. I mean, I wasn't buried. <laughs> I love my mother-in-law. I tell her, I, I said, she's so good. I don't even have to pay her to be good. She's good for nothing. No, <laughs> I don't need to say that to her. But anyway, I've got a good mother. Even while we were enemies, he what? Reconciled. To reconciled us. By the death of but, his son. Okay. What reconciled the human race? The death on the cross. Help me out. The death on the cross. So his death reconciled the human race. Is that correct? Is that consensus Amen. here? Yes. That's before we ask him. And there's people that haven't asked him to forgive him yet. But they're already what? They're already what? Now, there's another point. Read the rest of it, Linda. Much more. Much more. Being reconciled. Being reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. We shall be saved by his life. So here's what this house teaches. The whole world is reconciled. So the heaven and hell issue is dealt with. But millions of people know nothing about the life of God. That's where we talk about being saved. Somewhere or another, if you're going to enjoy this life, there's got to be a recognition or a uh, initiate, not initiation, what I'm, activation, thank you, Holy Ghost, an activation of what's already been done. I used to say when I knelt at the old truck seat on our front porch, at home, I used to say, that's when I let Jesus in my heart. You know my story about that. Yeah. I'll tell it again. Jackie didn't hear it. <laughs> I, this was back in another building we were in before this when I'm playing my guitar and we're in worship and I'm saying, oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I'm so thankful, Lord, that I let you in my heart. And he said, in my, he said well, that was very nice of you. <laughs> I created the whole universe. I made you the world in the span of my hand. That was sure nice that you let me in your heart. Yeah. <laughs> and I repented. I come to understand he was already there. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't know. That. But my salvation experience was an eye-opener or an awakening that he's in here. He's already there. I was already reconciled, but I didn't know nothing about the life of God, so my recognition or my activation of that was my new birth experience. Yeah. You something to I was just going to say, um, you know, my dad and, and Yvonne always say grace uh, before dinner with us, and my dad will always say, you know, thank you for visiting, thank you for coming to visit us at dinner, you know, to God. He's yeah, like saying, well, that's good. No, 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 it's not good. <laughs> and I try to tell him, Daddy's not oh. visiting you. He lives here. He lives there here. There you go. You that's know? good. That's I can't good. get him to, you know, like, understand that. Amen. See, we, we've grown up with song. We have a <laughs> song mentality oftentimes that God is outside of us. Yes. You know, uh, we've got a mansion over the hill. Well, <laughs> the mansion's here. You know, thank you. I appreciate that. Amen. Our song, did a songbook theology that God's out there someplace. You know, when the Bible says uh, the carnal mind is enmity or hostile to the love of God. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's opposes the love of God. And I looked up the word carnal. It's that which is external. So every, I got to look here. I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. I marry folks and bury folks. And yet, everything I believe is outside of me. God is up there, the devil's down there, God's, heaven's up there, hell's down there. Everything I believe was outside of me. And I began to understand that God's here. He left a deposit of himself, I'll get to that in a minute a little more. He left a deposit of himself when he ascended. He left a deposit of himself in all of humanity. That's why whether you go to church or not go to church, there's a dynamo on the inside of us to do. We want to do what's right, and we know, you know, you don't need a sermon to know when you do something that's not right. That's right. That's right. Amen. There's something on the inside of you, and that, that, 
that deposit of God in there. And that's what he's drawn to. He's not drawn to you or me because of my background, my, my boy, I tell you, sure, sure and because of my family pedigree. Most, most of my mom's side, they were pagans plus, you know. <laughs> Dad's side, they were a little more educated, and most of them love the Lord. Mom's side, oh, mercy. <laughs> He didn't go to a family reunion. He's afraid he'd get shot. You know? <laughs> so, you know, God wasn't drawn to me because of my, my background or my genealogy. He was drawn to me because of that deposit that God put in me before I was born. You know, that's, that happens to all of us. Uh, let's look. At, how many of you got your Bibles? Hey, Chase always brings it back. You got your Bible. I want you to look at, uh, I didn't have this plan, but I, a lot of this <laughs> plan, I already said. Ephesians chapter 1. I, you know, I've read this for years, and uh, a few years ago it just jumped out and slapped me. Not really, but I mean, in the spirit, this thing started jumping off the page at me, and I didn't realize. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's where the heavenly places are in Christ. Not up in heaven, but in Christ. According as he hath, what's hath? Past tense. Hath chosen us in him when? Before the foundation of the world. Man, if he's chosen us before the foundation of the world, what, what more can we need to say about that? <laughs> That we, sh here's what he chose, that we should be number one, holy, number two, without blame, and three, before him in love. Having predestinated, I'm not talking about the predestination teaching that, you know, some are predestined to be go to heaven, no matter what they do, and some are predestined to go to hell. I'm not talking about that at all. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a word that means we were destined previously uh, in him. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And I wrote in my Bible, when? Now I wrote a little arrow up there, that other verse that said, before the foundation of the world. That's what Jamie was teaching us the last two services. The unconditional love of God. He's already chosen every person. They're already reconciled because of his death. Amen. Now, there's, there's not, they're not saved. They don't know anything about the life of God yet. So they're bugging along in the world still killing folks. Not knowing. It's not already reconciled. Doing all kinds of havoc in the world. Hurting little children. I tell you what, when I see my grandkids, did y'all see uh, Cameron uh, or Camden on the Facebook laughing the other day? Yes. I can't understand somebody burning them with cigarettes or putting them in. Uh, I heard a babysitter put her put the baby in the oven. Uh. That is so inhumane. I mean, we don't see animals treating their babies like that. And yet, it's like when somebody like Jamie preaches unconditional love of God, he loved it no matter what. We, we want to help God out. We want to bless them folks with a brick. I, I do. It, David's hard for me to get that mixture out of me. Because I grew up with that. God hates sin. And he does. But he loves the sin. Yes. Amen. He, he hates sin, but he loves the sin. Yes. You know, we can start naming lifestyles and all kinds of stuff, but God loves the person. Yes. If we can just do that unconditionally and let the Holy Ghost work all those those situations out, I tell you, I'm learning. I'm just learning from people. <clears throat> well, what about this? People say, well. My, my son died. Where was God in that? Well, wherever you left him. <coughs> you know, it's amazing how people don't want to commit any of their life to God, but when something, uh, 
a catastrophe happen to him when God was there. Mm -hmm. God still loved him. I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you in a nutshell what happened. And I've taught if you want to see this in more in detail, check out our, our uh, YouTube on the mystery of godliness. Before God ever created man, he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And let them have dominion over the earth. He didn't say, let us have dominion. Let us and them. He said, let them. So that's why I called Penny. So I called Penny this week and I said, Penny, <coughs> Sue's sister, for you that don't remember, and he's, Sue's sister who's struggling with cancer. I said, Penny, you don't have to talk. Sit down in an easy chair. Hold your phone and put your hand over your lung. We're going to proclaim it. And you say, Brother Mike, what if it don't happen? What if it does? I'm thinking maybe it takes a lot of development to believe that. I'm wondering how many generations it's going to take to really believe that. I'm, I'm trying my best to believe it now. If she died tomorrow, I did what I know to do. And I'm not saying she's going to die tomorrow, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, we've got to do what, what we're learning to do. Mm -hmm. When all these storms that, that I've been able to stop for three years now in my truck, every storm has stopped. Not not 90%, but 100%. And I said, Lord, it seemed like all these storms will just obey me. When I get to church, I can't pray a head off, a headache off of somebody. <laughs> Why is it? He said, quit, quit praying. Not quit. He said, quit praying. I'll start proclaiming it. And I thought, you know, why do we shut our eyes and pray a long prayer? Because we want the, the acceptance of the people. Right? We want them to feel like, I don't know, I don't think this intellectually, but I, in the back of my head I think, you know, I just want them to feel like I'm trying to do what's right. Jesus said, he went off and prayed. Now, I'm not against praying. Well, he just went off and prayed, and when they come to him, he just say, be healed. The guy's way the hand. Just work your hand. It's just work your hand. If you can't just say, just do as the other. He, but I noticed he, he required the people always to do something to release their faith. Always. Mm -hmm. Just work your hand. You know? mm -hmm. Do this. It's not by works. But God is, tr Jesus was pulling their faith out of them. You know, the man who sat by the pool. Get in the pool. Well, ain't nobody here to help me. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If, I, if every, every year somebody got healed in that pool, I'd be getting my buddies down there. I'd say, you used to get behind me, and you give me a swift kick. Just <laughs> at the right time, I went in there first. But even down there, how, all these years, and nothing had happened, but other people got healed. So, anyway. I was going to use my whiteboard today, but I didn't get it up here. Anyway, I, I thought about being redeemed. I looked at the word demon. Just the word deem. D-E-E-M. It said to judge, to think, and to believe. So I looked up the little suffix, or prefix, R-E. What does R-E mean? It said, <coughs> back or again, as in repay, reappear, recopy. So I looked in the dictionary for redeem. It says to give back, or to buy back, or to recover. Look in the Strong's Concordance, and it said the word redeemed, to rescue from loss. That's what, or to ransom. That's what Jesus did in his death. He rescued the whole human race that Adam had taken down in his disobedience. So with that, you that have Bibles, uh, Linda, you get uh, Galatians 3.10. And they you got a Bible? Yep. Look up John 1 29. And and uh, Joyce, you look up Titus 2 11 through 15. This will help me out. Go back to it. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Luke 19, for the rest of you, look at Luke 19. Luke 19. 
Okay. Luke 19 and verse 10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is lost. What was lost in Adam? Relationship. Now think of this. Adam was created, created pure. Set in the garden of Eden to tend to it. No weeds. And then he listens to Eve and he blames her and for, for talking to Satan and eating the fruit that they shouldn't have eaten. And God comes on the scene and he says, where are you? Now listen, if God knows everything, <coughs> knows all, where we're all at, knows everything you're thinking, he wasn't asking them where they were at because he knew that. He was asking them, where are you at in your understanding? Where are you at? So they hid themselves. Meaning, they had lost that relationship because God would walk with them in the cool of the day and had fellowship, had communion. Now they're hiding. And he says, we're naked. Well, you was naked yesterday. Who said you were? I'm not, I'm not propagating nudity. I'm just saying. <laughs> he said, who told you? It was after the what we call the fall that they understood that. So he said, the son, the son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost, which is a relationship. Who's got John 1.29? Mm. Okay. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God what? Is what? Takes away the sin of the world. Sins or sin? Sin. Sin. sin? sin. The sin of the world is unbelief. When you're in unbelief, you'll do all kind of wicked stuff. Get it in the scripture. Let me read your next. What do you have? Galatians 10, 30. Okay. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law. Okay, no man's what? Justified by, by the, the law. law. Now we're not talking about the Ten Commandments necessarily. Remember this is this is way after that. Jesus had done come on the scene. He's already been crucified. Paul's still dealing with those Pharisaical situations. He said, we're not justified by what, Linda? By the law. We're not justified by the law. In the sight of God. Okay. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. All right. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in faith. All right. Joyce? Minus 2, 11 through 15. Okay. For, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The grace of God that bringeth what? Salvation. Has appeared? To all men. Well, wait a minute. Maybe all don't mean all there. Maybe it just means a few. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm being facetious here. No, just, no. just to give us the thing. The, the sub, that's right. Read that again. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all. Has appeared to all. Go ahead and read some more. Read it. Does that end in chapter or verse 15? That chapter can't read the, all the rest of it. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Now see, that's part of it. Teaching denying what? Ungodliness and worldly lusts. Okay. We should live soberly. Okay. Righteously. Okay. And godly. Okay. In this present world. All right. Age. This present age. All right. Looking for that blessed hope mm -hmm. and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now let me stop you right there for a minute. Here's a point I want you to understand. For us to be effective in the earth, God needs to appear in Robin. Religion have us waiting to see something in the sky. I'm not opposed to that. But for me to live to be a blessing in my world, he needs to appear in me. Right? When they see me, when they see Robin, when they see Linda, they need to see, they may not articulate it as seeing Jesus, 
They just may say, oh, what, what's going on then? But I sure like them. You know, that's the only way the world is. I said, I go to their house. I feel peace in that house. I don't know what's going on there, but, you know, that's the presence of God. I don't feel animosity. I don't feel fighting. I don't want this. I just like it. I just like to be with Bob and Tammy. I don't know what it, what it is. I just like it. Whether they, she prays for me and lay hands on me or not, I just like it over there. That's what we're talking about. The coming of the Lord in you all. And in the name of the Lord. the name of Lisa. The coming of the Lord. Now, if he comes in the sky at some point, I'm not opposed to that. Hallelujah. But I want to live here with this in mind. So if that happens, still okay. Go ahead and read it. That Greek word for, for appearing there means manifestation or brightness. Oh, good. Love that. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Now, I don't know how to rebuke with all authority here. I really don't. I don't want to scold anybody, but I just really want to tell you emphatically, God's love is unconditional. I tell you, for the people I don't like. No, I want to tell you something, honestly, honestly good. Now I have a problem with ISIS, and I have a problem with this guy that shot all these people, but I do say I love everybody. I love them in this respect. I love them so much, I, w I want them to know God in His fullness. I just wonder if, if some member of ISIS would get in the presence of somebody who knew what we're talking about and their little baby was sick and dying and we scoop them up in our arms and sick and pray for them, they're healed. Oh, what do One ISIS could change a thousand. One of them. What we don't see and what, what CNN and Fox News and all those other channels don't show you that in those countries there's thousands of young people coming to Christ. Thousands are coming to Christ. So when we teach the un the un the un the un uh, unconditional love of God and we're teaching against the law, we're talking about these pharisaical laws that come and, and cause people to, to not have any life and spirit. That's mean rules and regulations that they, they can't be free to just worship the Lord. In his burial, we learned that he went to, to, to prison, to those in prison, and took captivity captive. I've always said he took, but I read in the scriptures this week, it said he led captivity He led. We thought he was just in a grave for three days. But something else was happening in the spirit that these physical eyes can't see. All the, Peter said he went and preached to those people in Noah's day. All those people died in the flood. You see, I love what, what Dave ministered a few weeks ago about. Start with Abraham. How it looked like God didn't like this one. He liked that one. He didn't like this and He liked that. He, all, he worked all those saints to get Moses or to get Joseph down to Egypt. Work all of that out. You know, when people wonder about why God's doing there, why why people hadn't responded, I said, just they hadn't had enough events in their life. Just keep loving them. Just keep loving them. They're going to hit enough stone walls and you know, keep finding they're going to say, hey, you know at school they used to grab you and say, say uncle, it didn't take much for me. I don't like pain. <laughs> My brother, he could wrap his arm all around the back of his neck, and he just wouldn't get hardly. But eventually, he would. But anyway, in his resurrection, which was a triumph over death, we were, we he arose to see that all that he purchased would bow their knee and confess with their mouth. It's amazing in the New Testament. Now, do you not write it? No practice. I know it. <laughs> He's got a little practice. <laughs> It's amazing 
in the New Testament called Jesus the Christ. In other places, they called him the Christ of God. So in his ascension, he left his spirit, which is Christ, to infiltrate the, every human being. I call that the seed of Christ. It's kind of like the woman about Jesus talked about it. He had a measure, a, a measure of leaven and three measures of meal. And, he, and Jesus went on to say, till, all made, till the whole was leaven, till the whole meal was leaven. That's what happened in Jesus. When he went back to the far end of the Father, he deposited himself. I don't know how he did that. Just in the Spirit, he deposited a seed of himself in, in everybody. Amen. But we've been so indoctrinated with this mixture, or I have so long, it's so hard to comprehend that God would love that God and shock those people. I didn't want him to kill himself. I wanted him to incarcerate him. You know, you think about it. Don't we not like that? We don't like him shooting people like that. We may not articulate that in our brain, but Think about 20 years ago, wouldn't we? We all wouldn't, wouldn't we want him incarcerated? Absolutely. It's hard for me to think Jesus loved him too. Mm. I'm sure not upholding what he did. Don't get me wrong. We'll take that. But we've been so indoctrinated this mixture that it's, it's hard to understand. I want to read the scripture in Hebrew. Uh, Linda, get to 2 Timothy 1.9 and, and uh, Susan, you get your Bible? Get 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9. We'll end with that. I'm going to look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. You know, in, in Daryl's case, I appreciate him coming for as much as he can come for today. And I see Chase and Michelle have has uh, commitments and uh, one Sunday was here and a guy had a word for you guys. He had already left. And I said, you know what? To stay and they, stay they come for as much as they could come. Boy, I appreciate that. Hebrews 2, 9. Verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death covered, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. His death, his death. I mean, his death was different than anybody else's. The Bible says they turned dark. There was an earthquake. Rocks broken too. All kinds of things happened. The whole landscape of, of, of Christianity changed. The whole landscape of, of the kingdom changed totally when Jesus came. Uh, second, who got second Timothy? One nine. One nine. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. All right. According to what? His own purpose. His own purpose and grace. Go ahead. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Oh, my gosh. And we're still full of hate. I, I take it back. You guys are not present company acceptance. <laughs> the church world. A lot of church was still full of hate. So let's read our last scripture, Second Peter 3 9. Oh, Sue. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Wait a minute. Have you ever been slack concerning your promise? Mike, if you ever promised <laughs> Joy something that you couldn't carry out right then? I have. Not Joy, but I have a win. <laughs> I promised Mikey I'd come take him out for dinner two years ago. <laughs> I don't think I've taken him out yet. <laughs> he reminded me too. <laughs> so, but God's not, not slack concerning his promise. Go ahead. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is kind to all. Right. But is long suffering uh -oh. for us. Long suffering. And one preacher said, I'll preach faith every which way. I preach the love of God every which way, but it comes long suffering. It's just suffering long. <laughs> He's long suffering with us, toward us. Go ahead. Not willing that any should perish. Not willing. Now wait a minute. If God is not willing that any should perish, you think that's true or is that just partly true? I think it's 
true, don't you, Margie? But that all should come to repentance. That all should come to repentance. So repent. So repentance is part of the plan. Is part of the plan. And repentance, you know, I like when people go up the altar and they cry. I just like crying. You know, I think it shows remorse. But it's a change of mind. Or repentance is changing your mind. And we have to change our mind concerning the all-encompassing love of God. Jamie Englehart was very intense with that aspect of it. But I want to share today how when we talk about law, we're not talking about Ten Commandments necessarily. We're talking about all them, the, the Pharisees attached to it, some over a thousand of them. So long and short of this, love God. Just love God. Love the Holy Spirit. And you can enjoy life. I don't. Uh, I don't like things that happen in this. Cause we're, we, we're uh, involved in this world system. You know, people say I'm not the world. Well, I am. I go to the same bank that everybody else goes. I meet them at the gas station. You know, Linda buys groceries at the same grocery store. You know, <laughs> we do everything everybody else does. But we're not a part of that system that controls us. We're controlled. By the love of God. That we will love those who others don't love. That's pretty straight. Thank you. Praise God. I hope you got something out of this. I, uh, yes. I, uh, it, it, it ministered to me. I'll say that. If, whether it ministered to you or not, it's kind of helped me to get a, a handle on the, the all encompassing love of God, how He loves everybody. Unconditionally, Jamie Inglehart that was here last week, he ministers to a whole different group of clientele than we do. He's he's dealing with drug addicts, and he says sometimes he sees a puff of smoke come up in a, in the room when he's preaching. He's he's teaching that he preaches to all those people in inner city, and he just loves them. Yeah. And that's one of the long ways in his ministry there. So anyway. I don't want you to think that we don't we think anything's okay. That's not what we preach. Joyce just read a scripture to stay away from stuff that's ungodly. That's uh, what are some other things said there? Ungodly. Uh, unrighteous. What? Unrighteous. Unrighteous. You know, anything's not of God. Stay away from it. Amen. You'll be surprised how much God loves you and a lot of things you can do. Amen. Amen. You can go out and eat, eat dinner on Sunday. My, my aunt and uncle got saved in the Nazarene church and they were so legalistic. She would fix all the meals on Saturday. They didn't eat on Sunday, you know. And that's okay. That was, they got through that and later didn't follow that. But it got, you know, Dave is what they needed at the time. It's what they needed at the time. They wouldn't read a newspaper on Sunday. They wouldn't cook anything on Sunday. And uh, I'm sure they ate. <laughs> anyway. If you want to go out to Applebee's today, it's okay. Just bless the food. <laughs> you know, really, you ought to bless it more there than you do at home. Amen? Amen. Uh -huh. I don't know if it's fit in it or not. You know, I'm just saying. I don't never send nothing back. I promise you. Because I've seen too many any YouTubes on that. What the cooks do when they send the food back. I just either yeah. leave it or get my teeth and bear it. <laughs> Father, we thank you for a great day today. We thank you for the listeners. We thank you, Lord, for their ears. We thank you for those who heard by the Spirit what we were trying to say. And I thank you, Lord, we'll leave here a better person than we came. I thank you, Father, we leave here. We'll, we'll have a joyful sound in our tone. We'll have a joyful sound in those that we talk to, and those we meet. And we will love them in spite of doesn't mean that we love their actions. It doesn't mean that we even tolerate their foolishness. But Lord, we will love them. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. And Jackie, thanks for coming. <laughs>